Welcome to Oil & Gas with Energy Law Prof. Today we're going to talk about trespass and trespass related claims. What happens if you search for oil and gas or find and start producing oil and gas on land where you really didn't have the right to produce the minerals? So first, let's talk about those exploration activities that you would use to discover if there's oil and gas on a particular property. And there's a lot of different ways that you can look for oil and gas. You can use a gravimeter, which actually measures the density of subsurface rocks. You can use a magnetometer that predicts subsurface structures based on the magnetism of those uh, subsurface rocks. And most commonly, and what we're going to talk about mostly, you can do conventional seismic exploration, which is where you're predicting the subsurface structure based on sending sound waves into the earth and how they reflect back gives you a sense of where the boundaries between different layers are, what other kind of layers there are beneath the earth that might contain oil and gas. We'll also talk about more advanced versions of seismic that can be used to uh, determine sort of the 3D structure of the reservoir, where a rock layer extends to. And then we'll talk about even 4D seismic, which basically is the same thing, but showing how those rock layers change over time if you have oil and gas production, as well as maybe some produced water that's extracted from that reservoir. So here's a basic picture of how seismic works and what i want you to see here is that you have an energy source that is sending those sound waves into the earth and basically they reflect back up to the earth and they uh, reflect in different ways depending on the density and the structure of that subsurface and the way that you get that information back is with detectors that will be spread out so one way to do it would be with a recording truck that would have you know both the energy source that's sending out those sound waves and then you have detectors that are picking up those reflected uh, seismic signal and that can be used to make inferences about how the rock layers are structured beneath the earth. Now here is one of those uh, thumper trucks that would actually make the noises, make those sound waves that end up being reflected back to listening station. Here's a recording truck that might have, you know, a whole string of sensors out behind it that are picking up those seismic waves. As we described, you could have a 3D seismic picture that's taken from putting all those seismic readings together and trying to make inferences about what kind of rock layers are beneath the earth, how they might be angled or folded, where that might mean there could be a trap of oil and gas, especially if we knew you know, what kind of uh, structures those were from what you know, particular times in history, whether they'd be more likely to contain uh, oil and gas. Okay. This same method, basically you have a noise source and you have some detecting sources, can be used in any environment. So here's an example of it being used, obviously, in an Arctic environment uh, with snow. Uh, it's commonly used at sea as well. So with marine seismic, you have, again, you have a noise source for the beginning of those seismic waves, which, you know, can be right here, uh, you know, close to that seismic vessel. And then you have a whole series of listening stations that are able to take those seismic waves back and, uh, you know, interpret them based on how they are reflected back from that sound source. So that commonly happens at sea as well. Uh, you can also see that we'll have, if you look at all these different methods of determining what kind of rocks you have underneath the earth and whether they might contain oil and gas are all kind of summarized on this slide. So on this slide, you can see, you know, that we're seeing a couple different modes of seismic survey, one being with a, you know, a truck on land. Uh, and then you also have the mode of a ship at sea. You can also see that sometimes those other ways of detecting uh, rocks beneath the earth that we talked about, uh, you know, grab a uh, gravimeter or a magnetometer can be done uh, aerially. Uh, and then you can also see that, you know, sometimes you're actually looking at rock outcroppings and seeing what kind of rock is there to determine what kind of rocks might also be beneath the earth. Okay, so that's how you do exploration. But let's talk about the rules applicable to when you're allowed to explore. And we're going to start talking about that through an Oklahoma case 
Enron versus Worth. It's on page 100 in your 8th edition text. In this case, Enron wants to do seismic exploration of a piece of land, but the surface owner denies access. Enron has permission from some of the mineral owners. So this is the kind of situation where you're most likely to have conflict between the oil and gas producer and the surface owner, where the mineral ownership is separate from the surface ownership. So normally, if a surface owner owns the minerals, they probably want the oil and gas company to come on as much as they need to to start producing oil and gas because that surface owner, as the owner of the minerals as well, is going to get a share. However, in the circumstance where, as here, there's separate mineral ownership and surface owners, the surface owner really may not like that oil and gas production because it's not making them rich. It's just an inconvenience and it can cause damage to the land, as we'll see. So uh, in this case, Enron has permission from some of those mineral owners, but not all. And so, you know, the perspective of the service owner is, well, you shouldn't be coming on there. You don't even have uh, permission from all the mineral owners for, uh, to look for oil and gas on this land. Court, in this case, says no. The rule is that anybody who has a mineral interest share is allowed to authorize another party, like Enron here, to come on and search for oil and gas and to produce oil and gas. Uh, now, that means that permission from any fractional mineral interest owner, maybe somebody that only owns a one quarter of the mineral interest or one tenth, is sufficient to allow exploration and we'll see even production. Now, there are states that, like Louisiana, is the example given in your text, have provisions that say you can't go on that land to start exploring or start producing unless 80% of the mineral owners agree to that. So you have to have, you know, if you only have three quarter mineral interest that wants to lease to you and authorize your production, that's not enough. You need 80%. Now you might ask, why do most states have this rule that as long as you have that mineral interest, you're allowed to even a small fraction of it, you're allowed to go on and explore. As we'll see in later cases, the basic reason is that generally nobody's going to want to do much exploration or production unless they have, have the bulk of the mineral interest anyway, because they're not going to be allowed to, once they start producing, keep that, all that oil, unless they have the full mineral, uh, mineral share. And if Maybe it could be worth it if they have most of the mineral share, but typically if you're just a very small fractional interest owner, you're not going to uh, go on and start exploring or producing anyway, as we'll see in later cases. All right, so uh, let's move on to the next case, Kennedy versus General Geophysics. This is a Texas case. It's from 1948. It's on page 106 in your text. Now, in this case, the basic problem is that the exploration firm was going right up to the border of Kennedy's property. And these, when you send out those sound waves, of course, they send out in all directions. And so Kennedy, the plaintiff here, says, you know what? Those vibrations that you're sending onto my land damage my land in a couple ways. One is they're just a trespass because a sound wave actually causes the land to move and you don't have any right to be on my land so you don't have any right to you know, move the molecules on my land through that sound wave secondly uh, kennedy says you are unlawfully getting seismic information about my land because those sound waves which are used to explore that subsurface uh, rock formations are entering onto my land okay so you might wonder, well, why is it even a problem to get information, seismic information from some, somebody's land? I mean, maybe it's not very nice to keep that information from them and just keep it for yourself. We'll see in future cases how having somebody do seismic exploration of your land can actually cause you damage. And the basic reason is that if they find out that you don't have any oil and gas, your land, which might have been worth somebody something to somebody, you could have sold it sort of as a speculative asset or gotten a bonus for somebody to lease it, all of a sudden may become worthless if it's discovered it has no oil and gas on it. 
Here's what the court says in this case. First, vibrations alone aren't trespass. Yeah, uh, you know, of course, we understand that when a sound wave spreads, it does have some physical impact on your land as well. But, you know, we all know that we sometimes hear sound from our neighbors. That's not a trespass. So without actual damage to the property, that's not those sound waves spreading across the property line aren't a trespass. Secondly, the court says there's no evidence that in this case, the company, the exploration company, receives seismic information from Kennedy's land. So again, think about this. If we look at this, uh, if we look at a, you know, sort of a vertical cross section, imagine the land is like this. If the sound waves are coming onto Kennedy's land, they bounce back onto Kennedy's land. So unless there's a listening device on Kennedy's land, you don't actually end up getting any seismic information from Kennedy's land. Because again, to draw that, you basically only get information from up to the boundary to up to where you are able to place listening devices. Now, this circumstance would be a little bit different if you actually had surrounding properties and you were sending out sound on one property and it was reflecting back to the other property, then you might end up getting information about rock formations beneath Kennedy's land. But in this case, the court says there's no evidence that there was actual information taken from Kennedy's land. So yes, the seismic waves extended there, but because they never bounced back to a listening device from the exploration company, that means there's no information taken from Kennedy's land. And given that, the court says, there is no liability here. So if they had gotten information from Kennedy's land, maybe the result would be different. Given that they didn't, there's no liability here. Okay, let's talk about a very important recent case about trespass. This one involves actual drilling rather than just seismic exploration. It's lightning oil versus Anadarko. It's a case from 2017 from the Texas Supreme Court. It's on page 112 in your book. The basic question here is if lightning can stop Anadarko from drilling horizontal wells through its mineral estate to produce Anadarko's adjacent minerals. And to help you understand what's happening in this case, let me just draw it out quickly. So let's imagine what really happened here is that there were two neighboring properties. The surface was owned by Texas on the right side and they ended up leasing that land to Anadarko. Okay, so the low, so Anadarko has the right to produce those minerals. Now, on the neighboring land, there was Briscoes, and they had a ranch, but they had leased to Lightning. So effectively, if you think about the subsurface as belonging to Lightning on one side, Anadarko on the other, Texas, the surface belongs to Texas, and to Briscoe. So what happened is that Texas said, you can't drill on my property. So I'm leasing the land, but you're gonna have to drill on Briscoe's property to access these minerals. And so when you have Anadarko producing on the other side, they're doing so by drilling through uh, the land where Lightning actually owns the lease. So the idea that Lightning has is, hey, you're not allowed to drill through my mineral estate where I'm allowed to produce the oil and gas. You have to uh, drill on your own land. Texas doesn't let you. Well, I'm sorry about that. Well, what, did, uh, what was uh, Anadarko's case for why it should be allowed to drill? Well, they had permission from the Briscoe Ranch, which owned the surface. So who has the right to authorize drilling through the subsurface? Is it the surface owner, which is Briscoe Ranch, or is it the lightning that has the mineral lease? And the court here says, no, it's Briscoe Ranch. Because remember, although we talk about a surface and a subsurface estate, those are just terms of convenience. In fact, that mineral owner only owns the minerals, the oil and gas. And so what we call the surface owner really owns all the non-oil non and gas parts of the property, including the non-oil and gas subsurface. And so Briscoe Ranch, as the surface owner gets to authorize drilling through that subsurface. They can't authorize more oil and gas production from the subsurface because that would belong to lightning, but they can authorize drilling through the subsurface to reach the neighboring subsurface. Okay, 
Lightning tries to make the argument that, okay, well, you're not only drilling through the subsurface where we're supposed to be able to produce oil and gas, but when you drill, inevitably, you are going to end up producing some oil and gas from that subsurface because we know with shale that oil and gas is trapped in impermeable rock. It can't flow. And so when you drill through it, you're going to be producing a little bit of oil and gas. The court here says, you know what, that's not enough to be a trespass in this case. So yeah, maybe it produces a tiny bit of oil and gas, but effectively lightning uh, it does is, you know, basically doesn't need any protection from this well that just passes through its property to reach the neighboring property. So that's the, the argument here of the court is that Briscoe can go ahead and authorize this drilling through to reach the subsurface underneath the state of Texas's property. Now, one question, why did Texas forbid any drilling on the surface? Well, that was because this was actually a natural reserve. And so Texas said, we're willing to lease the minerals to you, Anadarko, but you can't drill on our land. That's increasingly an option for landowners because of the ability to directionally drill and reach that subsurface from neighboring properties. All right, so that's Lightning Oil versus Anadarko. Let's talk about another trespass case, Grinberg versus City of North Glen. This is a Colorado Supreme Court case from 1987. It's on page 123 in your books. In this case, Grinberg had taken a coal lease from the state. So Grinberg had the right to produce coal if there happened to be coal on this land, and Grinberg had gotten that right from the state. Now, the city was interested in finding a wastewater reservoir. So it went to the surface owner and it said, hey, can we do some seismic to figure out if this would be a good area for a wastewater reservoir? That included basically surveying the area for coal. And as it turned out, they found out there was no coal there. Well, the court here says you are actually liable to Grinberg because Remember, Grinberg had the right to produce coal from this property, and you have basically just shown that that lease is worthless. And because that lease, before you did that exploration, would have had some value and now doesn't, and you didn't get permission from the party that owned the right to extract that coal, you're going to be liable uh, to Grinberg. So this is a good example of how an unauthorized seismic exploration can make you liable to that landowner whose seismic information you took without permission. Okay, let's talk about a couple of the kinds of damages you might receive for a trespass claim in oil and gas. So first, let's talk about the kind of damages you might be liable for if you drilled a well on property that wasn't your own, but it was dry, so it didn't have any oil and gas. You might say, well, hey, no harm, no foul. That's not how the courts are going to see it. First, they're going to say, you know what? There was a loss of speculative value here. So just as in the Grinberg case, this land was worth something before you proved that there was no oil and gas on it. So whatever it was worth before versus what it's worth now, that's the measure of damages, that loss of speculative value. Another mode of valuing your damages if somebody drills a dry well on your property is a sump set. So basically, you shouldn't have been drilling this well or searching for seismic unless you had a lease. And if you had a lease, you would have had to pay a bonus for that, as we'll describe. And so whatever I should have been paid as a bonus, you need to pay me now as damages because that's what you should have had to drill this dry well. Another kind of damages that might exist is slander of title. So if there was an opportunity to lease or sell your property and that was taken away because the potential purchaser said, wait a second, somebody's already drilling a well on your property. It must be that you don't have the right to lease to me or sell to me. That is slander of title because basically somebody is falsely suggesting that you don't have title to sell or lease your property. And as a result, whatever opportunity was lost because of that, it can be one measure of damages, even if the well that's drilled in trespass is a dry well. Okay, let's do uh, an example of this. Humble versus Kishi. This is a Texas case from 1925. It's on page 131 in your text. In this case, we have two different landowners, Kishi and Lang. 
They leased to Humble for a three-year primary term, but there's some delay in sending that lease to Humble Oil. And so Humble Oil thinks that maybe the lease lasts a little bit longer than it in fact does. And so uh, with one of those landowners agreed, but Kishi, the majority owner, the three-quarter mineral interest owner protesting, Humble actually drills a well. And as it turns out, the court says it's after the lease really should have expired because that delay wasn't relevant, even though Humble thought it was. And so the lease had expired. And so Humble was effectively trespassing on Kishi's interest. So after Humble drills that well, Kishi's land, because the well is dry, the Kishi's land is no longer worth anything. So it value decline from $1,000 an acre to $0 an acre. And so the court says that measure of damages, the loss of speculative value is what is owed to Kishi for drilling that dry well. Okay, next option. What if somebody drills a well, but they're trespassing and it's a wet well? In other words, it does have oil and gas. What are the liability then? What's the liability? What are the measures of damages? Well, the most typical re remedy would be trespass and conversion, which basically says, look, I get the well that you drilled and I get your equipment. And then the conversion issue, really the measure of damages depends on good faith versus bad faith. So if it was a good faith mistake that, you know, just think about that humble versus Kishi case, I thought that lease was ongoing, turns out it wasn't, you know, but it was an honest mistake. Then in that case, the oil that is produced, the, uh, you're gonna be allowed to subtract from that your costs of drilling for the oil. So the owner is gonna get basically what they could have gotten if they drilled themselves, which is the full value of the oil minus the cost of producing it. On the other hand, if it is a bad faith trespass, then you get all the oil and gas without subtracting any costs. So good faith means you get the value of production minus the cost of producing it. Bad faith means you just get the full value of production, which, you know, keep in mind, and this is common with trespass damages, that ends up with the landowner getting more than they possibly could have, yeah, even if the trespass hadn't occurred because if the trespass hadn't occurred, they would have had to pay to produce that oil. But because the trespass occurred and it was in bad faith, they get all the oil without paying for drilling the well themselves. Okay, a bad faith case. Kidd versus Hoggett. This is another Texas case. It's from 1959, and it's on page 139 in your text. This is the last case in this section. In this case, the Hoggett sued Kidd to say your lease is no longer valid and you shouldn't be acting like it is. Because as long as you are saying that your lease is valid, we can't lease our property to another party. Well, what happened in this case? Kidd had completed a well years ago that produced a little natural gas, but they had shut it in. As we'll see in later, uh, in later classes, you can, if you have a natural gas well and it is a potentially profitable natural gas well, you can shut it in if there's not currently a market for the natural gas that the well is producing. Because you don't need to just waste that gas. You can wait till there's a pipeline and a market for natural gas and then make a profit when that occurs. Now, when you shut it in, you have to make some shut-in payments. They're typically relatively low payments, uh, but they keep that well alive even if your normal period for drilling had expired. And so that allows you to just hold that well until you actually have a, a market for the natural gas. The problem here is that the well that Kid, Kid drilled never produced enough oil and gas to be profitable. It really never produced very much natural gas at all. And actually the way, there's a couple ways we know that. One is there was in the record uh, evidence that basically people in the area had been desperate for natural gas and yet through this whole period, the uh, kid had shut in the well. So clearly it was not a legitimate choice to shut it in, waiting for a market. There was a market. There just, the fact was this well didn't produce enough natural gas to be profitable. Uh, you know, secondly, the Hoggets lost a specific leasing opportunity. So there were other parties that were willing to go and produce that, uh, that land, but Kid, meanwhile, had just shut it in and was holding on to it. Now, question for y'all, why would Kid 
hold on to this land and keep making shut-in payments on it, even if they were small, if that well was never profitable? Well, here's the common reason that you see this kind of fact pattern in oil and gas cases, is that oil and gas companies in general want to hold on to land as long as possible. And the reason for that is you never know when there might be a new oil and gas bonanza. That can happen for a lot of reasons. The price of oil and gas could go way up and make something that wasn't profitable all of a sudden profitable. There could be a new reservoir discovered you know, deeper in the earth that all of a sudden makes the land very profitable even though it isn't now and you know there could be new techniques think of fracking that allow you to produce oil more profitably from the land and so every piece of land that you can hold on to the right to produce for is a potential lottery ticket and you just want to accumulate as many as possible so even if it means paying some shut-in payments you're happy to hold on to that just in case your ship comes in and there's a lot of oil and gas on that land and so landowners on the flip side are very wary of companies doing this basically holding on to their land without producing anything but just kind of holding on to it for as long as possible and you can see the reason why you know the hoggets were able to find other oil and gas companies that said you know what kid is incompetent we can go on and produce oil and gas for you and you'll start getting your real payout from the lease under the royalty the court here said Hoggets have evidence of malice, which means that this is deliberate uh, conduct without reasonable cause. So this is the bad face me measure of damages where you might have punitive damages or damages that really go beyond what would be normal consequential damages.